Tonight, a look inside the Seattle Children's Cancer Care Unit. I call those the electric slide doors. They slide on their own. Meet the patients and families. Yeah. Oh, you like and his tubi? Yeah, his tubi just like Levi's tubi. Share their struggles and success. Cancer definitely forces you to grow up. We hear from the people who are helping them conquer their disease. The children and young adults that we see today, 80% will be cured of their cancer. The challenge for us is we're not at 100%. And until we get to that, we still have work to do. The latest research in improving the lives of kids with cancer and those who fund it. We raise money for pediatric brain tumor research at Children's Hospital. See how new technology and tools play a role in saving lives. The patient themselves are radioactive. And how something as simple as a toy or music <laughs> can help kids heal. Nice and loud, nice and loud. And life after cancer. <laughs> how survivors of childhood cancer move forward. Embrace your journey and help others do so too. <laughs> Conquering Childhood Cancer, a Seattle Children's Special Report. Hello, I'm Molly Shen. Not so long ago, building hope here at Seattle Children's was just that, a hope, a wish, a need. That building is now a reality and a big part of it used to conquer childhood cancer. Tonight, we take you inside the Seattle Children's Cancer Care Unit. The opening of Building Hope in April of 2013, now called the Forest Zone, was a big day, full of fanfare, and for good reason. Two floors of this new wing of Seattle Children's Hospital are dedicated to cancer patients. 48 beds in large, private rooms, each with enough space so two parents are able to stay overnight. Lots of natural light and the ability to control lighting and temperature in each individual room add to the comfort and sense of control for each patient. Quiet rooms and family lounges give patients and families a place outside of their room for time alone or to be around other families or visitors and prepare food, watch a show, relax. The top floor, the AYA unit, was the nation's first standalone cancer unit dedicated to adolescents and young adults. Many years ago, we realized that the teen and young adult cancer group was a population that had not benefited from the incredible advances seen in cancer treatment, seen in younger uh, patients and older adults. Their overall survival has hardly increased at all over the last 30 years. There are many reasons for this. Um, one of the reasons that we thought we could address was there's a lack of a home. There's a lack of a place where they feel welcome, where they, they fit in. Uh, there also was not a focus on their, their population as a, as a whole. So we thought that in addition to focusing our, our research attention on this population, we could design a facility which met some of their needs and we could actually promote um, their cancer experience and actually improve their outcome. The Adolescent and Young Adult Unit creates a community for this age group. Their cancer diagnosis hits at a time of much change in their lives. So you're, you know, going through all of these really important life changes, establishing your self-identity, your independence, you're navigating romantic relationships, peer relationships, what do I want to be when I grow up? So now throw cancer into that. Everything's harder. All of that was hard to begin with. Now it's a lot harder. And now you have to redefine some of those things. So maybe you don't need to be as independent because you have a parent who becomes more involved and needs to help you take care of yourself. Maybe your peer relationships change. Maybe your life goals change. With all of that in mind, we developed this Adolescent and Young Adult Oncology Unit really to try to meet the particular needs of adolescents and young adults. So again, what is the biology of their cancer? There are specific cancers that they have and we want to offer them the best medical care that we have. But we also want to say, well, we have all of these other things that we know you will need, education, social work, maybe psychology, maybe child life, maybe chaplain support, art therapy. I mean, we have lists and lists and lists of people who we can really provide for these families who can help them go through this cancer experience again and recognize the whole people that they are. So I'm going to push start. For treating the whole person, the AYA unit includes a physical therapy gym for rehabilitation, fitness, or just letting off steam. 
all of that movement improves your lung health and improves circulation and keeps your bones and joints strong and keeps your endurance up so that when you're out of the hospital you can tolerate just normal daily activities. So and just your mental well-being too, getting out of your room, you know, chatting with people on the unit. Next to the gym, construction is underway for a rooftop terrace. When finished, it will offer a place for cancer patients to get fresh air, interact with nature, and take in the view of the world outside of hospital walls. The AYA unit is a state-of-the-art space to meet the specific physical, psychological, and social needs of teens and young adults with cancer, treating the whole patient, not only the disease. These are human beings. These are people with lives, and we want to make sure that they still live those lives to the best of our ability. And so to just say we're only going to give you chemotherapy and check your blood pressure isn't complete. You know, we're going to do that, and we're going to do that really, really well. But we're also going to see you. We're going to see who you are, what matters to you, and how we can enable you to thrive. So you've gotten the official tour of the cancer care unit. Now we'd like you to see the place through the eyes of a real expert, someone who has lived here. Here's a creative look at one young man's crib. What up, people? Uh, this is your boy, I Bizzle. I'm a rapper and a songwriter, and I'm about to show y'all my crib. Let's go. This is me, Casa. I call those the electric slide doors. They slide on their own. Flat screen right here. Not only is it a flat screen, but wait for it. It's a computer too. I said, you know what? Get it, have to sit in the bed with a computer when well, my TV can be my computer. Just, just get my chair, you know, it kicks out. And just relax, you know, watch a couple YouTube videos, cat videos. I got another TV, you know, just in case some peeps don't like what I'm doing over there. They could chill over here, you know, got them a pillow cover. This bad boy turns into a bed, everything, you know. And I keep my valuables in here, my Kelly Clarkson CD, signed, my silly putty, you know, just in case a brother gets stressed, needs something to squeeze on. Ain't nobody getting those. That's my value. This is my bathroom. I could sit down and shower. Sit down and shower. That's how I do, you know, come in here. Bam! Bam! Mini fridge. Look at that. I got my apple juice, orange juice, milk, water. You know, most people, I ain't gonna brag or nothing, but most people, they got a white board. Your boy got a red board. Look at that. All right, y'all. Now we gonna, you know, go on down to what I call the quiet room. up in here. It's my quiet room. This is where all my homies come when they want to be quiet. This is my wonderful view. You know, got the view of the trees, you know, lake washing over there. Thank you, sir. You know, I can't just look like this overnight. You got to put work into it. Come over here, show you my wall of goodies. That's how I do it. Come see me. Uh, this is my lounge, you know. Me and the homies come in here, we chill. Xbox 360, we be online till they break it down. You know how the cushions be falling off the couch. You see, mine, mine's don't do that, you know? Got the keyboard, hooked up to the TV. 
do whatever I want. Now this is taking tap to a whole nother level. I got a water machine like McDonald's up in here. Get yourself some ice. Get yourself some water. So I gotta deal with all my guests, so peace, have a nice day. Ibrahim, otherwise known as I Bizzle, created that video with help from the Seattle Children's Video Team. It's one of many ways patients are encouraged to be creative, express themselves, and dare we say, have fun while they're here. Coming up, a closer look at encouraging children, teens, and young adults to continue to thrive and develop while they're being treated here. How toys and music might be the best medicine. Treating the whole patient when we return. Welcome back. Conquering childhood cancer takes a village, a multifaceted team, to treat not just the illness itself, but the whole person and family. This is especially important at a children's hospital. Let's play. 21-month-old Kai has been feeling crummy today and pulling on her tubes. That's why Laurel is here with toys and tricks to help Kai cope. Oh, hello, Stegosaurus. As a child life specialist, it's Laurel's job to help normalize this hospital experience for patients like Kai. And normal for a 21-month-old is playing. Boom! Yeah. You knocked the house down! Yay! All kids know how to play. All kids know what they enjoy doing. So we build on that. We use that to our advantage to help them process their illness, process their stay, and continue being kids. This gives Kaya distraction. She's forgotten about those tubes she'd been tugging on earlier. Oh, tiger. Nice grabbing, Kai. Good job. It's also providing healthy movement and development. By setting up towers, we're encouraging her to reach out. By um, using the model magic clay, we're enc encouraging her to use that grasping strength. So what looks like normal fun play, we're actually working on goals that our uh, multidisciplinary team has set up for Kai. A teddy bear will star in Laurel's next stop. He has his Hickman line already. Bear is going to get a nasogastric or NG tube to carry food and medicine to his tummy through his nose. Bear needed, he needed a tubey too. Should we put one on Bear? Look, look, it's not look. going on you. No, no, for Bear, just for Bear. Seeing Bear get an NG tube will help 15-month-old Levi better deal with his. Here we go. Are you gonna help me? Here, help me do Bear. Oh, good job. Yeah. Here we go. A, a part of what we do as child life specialists is play with medical equipment. These kids are exposed to so many different pieces of medical equipment each day and during their stay that we want them to experience those, um, those instruments through play, to learn about them, what do they feel like. Then when kids are able to play with those medical instruments, they're less scared of them. They're more receptive to letting us take care of them. Bear needs his vitals checked too, blood pressure taken, <laughs> and Levi listens to Bear's heartbeat. On the adolescent and young adult unit, the overall goals of the child life specialists are the same, but the patients are definitely at a different stage. For them, developmentally, they're working on a sense of identity, um, who they are as a person. Um, and it's a pretty wide spectrum because teenagers, they're kind of developing their peer group and then you get all the way up to the college kids who are starting to gain their independence and they're just now stepping away from mom and dad and all of a sudden they're back in the hospital. Yeah. For 17-year-old Nick, what began as a few laps of exercise grew into a leadership and project opportunity. He's organized a unit-wide walking competition. I wanted to see more kids walking around the unit and less kids in the room alone. More kids out talking to each other, walking laps around, and just being more social. So I figured, why not start walking? Why not just start a competition for walking and have prizes at the end of it? 
You can actually have like the checkered flag. With the help of child life specialist Austin, Nick has developed an award system and a set of rules that are posted on the unit. Nick is making an impact in his community. So he's gaining a sense of mastery. I mean, it's, it's something that he gets to do. It was a goal he had, not only to create the project, but actually walking. Um, so he's setting goals, which is good, kind of giving himself things to look forward to. Um, try to keep patients from just kind of falling in the lump of, I'm just stuck here in the hospital, I'm just gonna be here until it's done. Try to give them things to look forward to and do throughout their day. And then every time you click it, goes up one. Nick holds the lap record on the unit, adding up to more than six miles in one day. But this project's success is also measured in the laps others do. Those he's inspired and encouraged as they set their own goals and take steps to achieve them. Just trying to keep them from going into a hole or staying in a hole, if I can get them out, um, if I can get them out walking around or doing something that they liked to do before they were in the hospital and kind of get back on track with who they were before they came in, that's, that's a win for me. When a child is diagnosed with cancer, a family's life can be turned upside down. Of course, the treatment is foremost, but families also need to deal with all the other stuff that comes along. Bills, juggling schedules, the emotional toll. That's where social workers come in to help with the big picture of life with a child fighting cancer. Okay. What does that mean? So the medical team told me to come in and ask you what the joke of the day is. Ashley is one of four social workers who work with cancer patients and their families here at Seattle Children's. Who's there? Punch. Punch who? I didn't tell you to punch anyone. <laughs> Think of Ashley as sort of a friendly guide helping families through their cancer journey from diagnosis through treatment <laughs> and during the transition back home and into regular life. While the providers focus on the medical care, social workers help with many effects cancer can have on a family. To just get that, the paperwork for, for you, and I can then go ahead and send that off. Okay, thank you. Yeah. For the practical support, we help out a lot with um, lodging resources and um, transportation assistance. We also help out with some financial assistance since a lot of families are at a financial hardship as a result of this, the cancer diagnosis and being away from their families. Um, tr families travel from Alaska, Montana, and Idaho, and so they are displaced for long periods of time. Okay. In addition to helping with practical, everyday needs, social workers also provide emotional support. This kind of journey is tiring and taxing on a lot of families, and um, they um, utilize us as uh, a source of that emotional support that they may not be getting from their community at home. What are you watching? It's on TV. A lot of Ashley's job is just dropping in to visit, listening, it? asking questions to see what a family might need to help them navigate an unknown, sometimes scary path. Uh, we ask about how the family's coping today, if there's anything that they need specific, if there's anything that we can help with, if they have any questions that maybe the medical team hasn't answered, we can help facilitate um, communication between the family and the medical team or encourage the family to make sure that they ask their questions to the medical team during medical rounds or when the providers are visiting throughout the day. So next week you and I have a Monopoly game to play. I love building relationships with families. They, it's so um, moving and, and rewarding to be able to help support them through such um, a challenging time but there's such a great team that can support them through the entire process um, that hopefully we can make things a little bit easier for them, okay? It's a date. Social workers also help with the important transition to life after cancer, looking ahead to the survivor phase. One important program here looks way ahead, helping kids conquering cancer to think about a family of their own someday. <laughs> So what classes are you taking this year? 17-year-old Shannon and her friend Lily are starting their senior year of high school. They're thinking about typical teenage girl things, grades and boys, and college applications. Oh, wow. 
A lymphoma diagnosis partway through her sophomore year was a bump in the road for Shannon, a pretty big one, but something she didn't let steer her away from milestones most girls hold dear. I got three weeks before I had to start treatment off so I could go to a dance with Tolo. It was important to me at the time. <laughs> I'm so glad I went. School dances are important to a teenage girl. In fact, while going through the toughest times of her treatment, planning for her prom gave Shannon something to look forward to, and she went to that prom. She didn't want cancer to take away something so special. But the treatment Shannon needed her second go around after she relapsed in her junior year threatened to take away something else important to a young woman, her ability to have children one day. And people just don't want to be alive after cancer. They still have the same goals and aspirations that they had before their cancer diagnosis. One of those being the possibility of having a family someday. And we know that for some patients, the treatment that we give them um, may impact their fertility and their ability to conceive children, uh, perhaps the way their peers or their siblings may. For both boys and girls, the same cancer treatment that can save their life can hurt their chances of conceiving a child. Leah Crone, clinical nurse specialist for the Adolescent and Young Adult Oncology Program, counsels young cancer patients about options for preserving fertility. That is one of the, um, it's one of the favorite pieces of my role um, because it's a very future-oriented kind of service and thing that we're providing to these patients right about the time where they're getting what they would consider a lot of bad news. Um, and so right about the time they're diagnosed and we find out, uh, we understand what their disease is and how we're going to treat it, we can look at the treatment and say, what kind of risk uh, does this treatment pose to their future fertility? And then we can counsel them appropriately. Because I still don't know if I'm infertile or not, but knowing that I have the option to is very comforting because I, I don't really want to close any doors at 17. For Shannon, keeping that door open meant giving herself weekly hormone shots, monitoring hormone levels, and having several eggs extracted and frozen for the future. It was a big commitment, especially for a teenage girl who didn't have motherhood on her radar screen just yet. Cancer definitely forces you to grow up. But in the midst of a fight against cancer, looking into the future can be a very positive thing. What we say is that you become a cancer survivor the day that you're diagnosed, and we really need to treat our patients that way and be thinking, be very forward thinking about making sure that we maximize the quality of their life after their treatment. They want to go back to school. They want careers. They want families. They want to be married. They want the same things that all young people want, and parents want these things for their children as well, too. So it's not all about just treating and curing cancer anymore. We have to think a little further into the future than that now. The nice, wonderful thing about Seattle Children's, Seattle Cancer Care, the University of Washington, they, not there, it's not the short term. They see you as a long-term survivor, and that's how they, they look at every single case. The future looks bright for this cancer survivor. Senior year of high school, college, career, and someday, a chance for a family of her own. I'm glad I did it, though. <laughs> I've always seen myself having kids in the future. It's nice knowing I can still do the things that I've always wanted to do, and my cancer didn't, you know, prevent that from happening. Shannon is looking at the University of Washington and a few universities on the East Coast. Her hope is to become an oncology nurse so she can help people through what she went through, both medically and as an important source of support. You'll find here at Seattle Children's, help in conquering childhood cancer comes in many forms. <laughs> From beatboxing. Very nice drumming, nice and loud, nice and loud. To drum beating. David Knott is the music man of Seattle Children's. Oh, hello, everybody. We're so glad to see you. So glad to see you. This board certified music therapist makes the rounds with his own kind of instruments of healing. We're so glad to see you. Hello, William. Helping them to 
relax, calm down when they're upset, in pain, anxious, frustrated, angry. Patients may think he's just stopped in to strum a tune, but he's strategic. Music can be the best medicine in many ways. I may be seeing a kiddo because they're having a tough time and they're maybe a little withdrawn and frustrated, but in the act of providing music for them and then getting them engaged in expressing themselves with music, they may open up and become more uh, verbal. If they sing with me, they're taking deeper breaths, they're getting better respiration. Um, if we get moving, that's increased activity, increasing their circulation. Don't tell Daniel, but he's getting a rehab session, not just a jam session. He's using his right hand, which is a small victory. Music has a way of encouraging movement, reducing pain, and making medicine more effective. It's time for music. That's why David is a welcome and frequent visitor to the cancer care unit. If you can begin to relax, um, I've seen... You know, kids that were really experiencing a lot of pain, once they start to relax, that medicine that's been in their system start to work and they, they calm down and often just fall asleep. Through his years of working in the cancer care unit, David has helped patients record their feelings in a unique and personal way. I think it's really beautiful the you know the rhymes that she was saying there you know rhyming helps me cope when I'm being poked with a needle from chemo therapy you know so sometimes it's really direct like that that they're expressing themselves and they're I mean this is a real clear idea of her experience and she's expressing it in music. Daniel, Daniel, he had a farm and two eggs in a frying pan. For David, a typical day at the office might range from hard rock to Bach. Somehow he manages to hit the right note for someone who needs it most. That's really the beauty of this work. It's when everything else falls away and you know you've got some a kid that is facing, you know, some of the most difficult challenges of their lives, but they're they're finding an opportunity to lose themselves in the music. And that's really powerful. It's really beautiful to be part of that. Coming up, the very latest in pediatric cancer research. Check out this special room, one of only a few in the country that could help this young man finally conquer his cancer. Welcome back. As you probably know, cancer doesn't always respond to the first try at treatment. Sometimes you have to take another crack at it, and sometimes you have to pull out all the stops. Meet eight-year-old Renee. This is about as close as most people can get to Renee for up to a week. Done. Even his own mother has to keep her distance. You haven't finished? Renee is undergoing what's called MIBG treatment for neuroblastoma. So MIBG um, is a relatively new form of therapy. It's actually been studied for over 20 years. Um, MIBG is a substance that's kind of a precursor of adrenaline, and it is taken up by about 90% of neuroblastoma tumors. So 90% of patients with neuroblastoma tumors will take up this substance. This is a scan of a patient with neuroblastoma. You can see the cancerous tumors throughout the body. This therapy sends iodine-131 into the bloodstream, attached to MIBG that these scattered tumors soak up like a sponge. The hope is the radioactive iodine delivered right to the neuroblastoma tumors will kill the cancer. But it's in awkward places, particularly for me, this treatment, um, gives me the peace of mind that he's getting radiation to his um, some areas in his head, but it's not probably going to affect his brain because it's not an external radiation beam that's gonna have to go all the way through. 
For up to seven days, Renee must stay in a lead-lined room with every hard surface wrapped in plastic. The patient themselves are radioactive, and so their urine, their sweat, their saliva, and just their body is radioactive. So we have to prepare the room in a special way. We have to have a special room that contains the radiation inside the room. And then patients need to have a fully catheter place so that we're continually draining their bladder so that we're not damaging their bladder by having urine that's radioactive sit in their bladder. So it takes really skilled nursing. It takes a whole team to prepare the patient and their family uh, for this type of treatment. A family room is built right next door. Video monitors allow patients and families to see and hear each other. Oh, this is, this is crucial. This is it. Because the, I don't know if you noticed, you can't see through the door. So you can't like <laughs> stick your face up there, but you really can't see. And you can't hear through the door either, which is, can be a little scary. So this we have either, either it's on in here for us or it's on at the nurse's station. There are currently only 11 centers in the country set up to deliver MIBG therapy. This one at Seattle Children's is one of only three west of the Rockies. Renee and his family traveled from British Columbia for this. Both parents can be in the room. Renee's parents can stay, even sleep right here next to their son's room the whole time. Technology is a real blessing. Hi. Did you talk to Grandpa? Skype, iPads, and video games help keep young children distracted and entertained. I haven't figured out a way to replace the hugging and the snuggling, and the, that is really hard. A radiation safety officer constantly monitors the level of radiation coming off Renee. She makes sure those who go in to care for him stay safe. The less amount of time with the child, who is a, basically a radioactive source, the less their exposure. Um, and then when they're in there, we also have portable lead shields to provide shielding because shielding reduces the exposure to patients, uh, to uh, staff from the patient. And um, distance, the further away they are from the patient, the less their exposure. Meds. Thank you. To limit the radiation exposure of hospital staff, parents help with Renee's care. Mom gets to go in for short amounts of time. Okay. She gives him oral medicines, helps check his vitals and get some precious time in the same room with her son. Renee, I love you. When she comes out, a Geiger counter helps make sure she doesn't bring any contamination with her. All of this is quite an ordeal, but worth it to try to conquer Renee's stubborn cancer. He's done chemo, external beam radiation, immunotherapy, a stem cell transplant, more chemo. Like he's put in, he's put in all of his effort and so it's important that we still have options for him. You know it's up. The measures that need to be taken for this therapy are tough on a mom and an eight-year-old boy who need to be separated, who can't cuddle for almost a week. But it's a week that could save Renee's life. I think we're very fortunate to be able to have this here. I think it holds promise as another form of therapy for children who have a very difficult to treat cancer. I'm very grateful for the staff that have worked to put this program together for our patients um, and I'm hopeful that this will be a, a, an exciting and effective treatment for patients with neuroblastoma. That's quite a treatment with a special room and all of those precautions. Wouldn't it be nice if our own bodies could just get rid of the cancer on their own? No chemo, no radiation, no major side effects. That might not be so far off. Milton Wright had already gone two rounds with cancer when round three came swinging. The last thing you ever want to hear in the world, you know. So it was horrible. It was the third worst day of my life. And I still remember walking in that room and saying, Milton, I have kind of bad news for you. Your leukemia is back. It was devastating news. I, I really thought I was done with, uh, with just everything. Milton had suffered the ordeal and side effects of a three-year treatment at age eight, then another two-year treatment as a sophomore. Neither Milton nor his mother was prepared for Dr. Rebecca Gardner's diagnosis. 
you know, she just kind of gave me some time just to kind of get in my emotions or my feelings a little bit. And, uh, you know, some of the, a lot, since a lot of the nurses know me in the Hemont Clinic, um, I had a lot of nurses come in and they were hugging me and talking to me and just, just saying, like, basically, I'm not alone. They're all here with me. But Dr. Gardner was offering Milton a new treatment, one that uses the body's own immune system to battle the cancer and only lasts six months. Six months just seemed like a breeze compared to two years or three and a half years. So if you think about ways to treat cancer, um, the immune system is kind of a very elegant approach. It's something your body is already equipped with. Um, and in general, your body is not good at recognizing cancer cells as being bad. So what we do in our trial is we take a person's T cells and we take them to the lab where we re-engineer the T cells so that they're able to recognize the cancer cells as being bad. So T cells have a receptor on them that allow them to recognize proteins. So proteins are something that are um, made in, in every cell that we have. And sometimes we talk about um, proteins being specific to a tumor type. And um, receptors are what enable the T cell to recognize the protein on whatever cell surface we're talking about. Um, and so the way that I like to think of receptors is like kind of a Velcro molecule, um, where it actually enables the T cell to stick to the cell that it's trying to kill. The T cells are given back to the patient by transfusion, where they find and kill the cancer cells. And when you think about different types of therapy, there's drug therapy where you take the medicine, um, your body metabolizes it, and then the medicine is gone. And the difference with our therapy, it's a living therapy. So you take the um, t dose of T cells, and then those T cells are able to um, kind of engraft in your body where they are able to make more of themselves. So it's not that you get a one-time dose and then they're gone. The idea is that they stay there and they replicate and they make more of themselves. Seattle Children's has plans to apply the technology to other types of cancer, swapping out the receptor on the patient's T cells to recognize the protein expressed on the specific cancer cell. So this could be applied to any type of cancer as long as we can target a protein expressed on that cancer cell with our new receptor. We are going to open a trial for patients with neuroblastoma. And so that will be our next kind of um, childhood cancer that we do. And we are actively researching how to use this um, technology for patients with other types of leukemia as well as other types of solid tumors and brain tumors. This breakthrough therapy is 40 years in the making, and it's all being done right here in Seattle. And it really is kind of, you know, grassroots Seattle um, kind of making these new therapies and then treating patients. A therapy that can actually cure cancer and leave the rest of the body unharmed. But this third time around, there's literally almost no side effects. I'm feeling great. None of these treatments would be available today if not for the research of yesterday. Ask any provider who treats cancer patients and they'll tell you they can't stress enough the importance of research, research, and more research. Kick one hard to mama. Nice. Five-year-old Jillian is living proof of how far childhood cancer treatment has come. As a toddler, <laughs> she was late in learning to walk. A well child check when she was 19 Last months fall. old showed all was not well. I remember looking at Patrick when they told us and just thinking, I can't, I can't do this. And he said, yes, you can. A cancerous tumor was growing in Jillian's brain. In the past, treating a tumor like this would involve radiation to the brain, but recent advances in identifying specific tumor types and clinical trials on treating this type showed success without radiation. Jillian was diagnosed right at this turning point where we felt like we had enough data to move that into standard of care. Um, and so our um, standard of care at Seattle Children's for Jillian's very specific subtype of medulloblastoma was to be able to treat it with chemotherapy alone. The advantage of that is that um, we did not need to use radiation and that reduces the chance of having any long-term side effects, particularly long-term side effects on the development of the brain. The side effects of radiation on a developing brain are sobering. 
nothing happens immediately. They look well, they can tolerate the treatments, but it's as they then go on to grow and develop and learn, you start to see them not keeping up. And the most concrete um, things that we see was there was a whole group of patients that were followed for 20 years. And if you look at people 20 years later um, who got whole brain radiation under the age of three, um, none of them have full-time jobs. None of them have finished college. None of them have been married. And so there are very real, it's not just IQ, um, there are very real things about how our brain's development that are important to who we are and um, what kind of life we lead. And um, it's important to preserve that. Here, here's Jillian. Get ready. Here comes mommy. Jillian should not have long-term side effects, and she is cancer-free. Research made a difference in her care and future. Whoa. It gave us confidence knowing that this is what you have, this is what we do. We have research, we have history, we have data that supports the kind of treatment you're going to get. And that just, there was, there was some peace that came with that. This family so appreciated benefiting from research, they agreed to donate Jillian's tumor to science to keep improving pediatric cancer treatment and survival rates. Everyone has in their mind that a diagnosis of cancer is a death sentence, that, uh, that you can't possibly survive. And that may have been true 40 or 50 years ago. It's not at all true today. Of the children and young adults that we see today, 80% will be cured of their cancer, which is remarkable. Uh, and that is such a uh, testament to all the research and all the progress that's been made over the last 40 to 50 years. Um, the challenge for us is we're not at 100 percent and until we get to that we still have work to do. That work continues every day. Nine-year-old Kayla was part of a clinical trial to treat a soft tissue tumor growing in her sinus cavity. The fast-growing tumor is the white you can see on her scan. Her trial compared the standard treatment of this type of tumor to the standard treatment plus an additional medicine. Kayla went through treatment like a trooper. She benefited from the research that came before and helped further it by participating in a clinical trial. She has the sniffles sometimes and she'll need some dental work to counteract damage to her developing teeth. Otherwise, Kayla is doing great. She's doing fantastic. The bureau will be five years out of treatment, so we're just kind of counting down till then. These families know firsthand that research is the key to conquering childhood cancer. I think that's super important for the kids to have a chance to have better treatments. I mean, I've seen other cancers come so far, and I know the childhood cancers can do the same thing um, with just the funds and research and time. Oh, it's what brings me to work every day. It's what gives me hope every day, um, because I know that what we do today, the progress we've made today, is entirely dependent on the research we've done in the past. Everything we do, everything we know, every part of the treatment we have, we can tie back to a research study. I can see the progress in my own career, and I know that that's what's going to happen in the next 20 years, and I know it's the work that we do today, the, the brave children and their parents who are willing to be part of research studies today, who will help us make those advances and make the treatment more effective with fewer side effects in the future. It's true that research is the key to conquering childhood cancer, but fundraising is key to make that research happen. Coming up, meet the people who are making that their mission. See the depths people will go to improve the lives of kids with cancer. As far as we've come, cancer is still the number one disease killer of children under 15. One of the biggest roadblocks to conquering childhood cancer is funding, funding the research that could lead to cures and better treatments. With government funding for research shrinking, individual and corporate donations are even more important to ensure research can continue. Hi. Headband. So these are sparkly headbands like the one I have in my hair. Could these colorful headbands help cure pediatric brain tumors? That might not be much of a stretch. It's fundraising efforts like this that move the needle in pediatric cancer research. So we are the Pink Bandanas Guild and we raise money for pediatric brain tumor research at Children's Hospital. Each of these girls was a friend of a little girl named Sarah who wore a bandana, usually a pink one, while battling a cancerous brain tumor. It originally started when we were in a Girl Scout troop with her 
And then after she passed away, we decided that we wanted to do something to keep her uh, memory alive. So we started the guild so that no other kids would have to go through what she went through. Members of the Pink Bandana Guild spend hours hand making headbands and ponytail holders. We have headbands on this side, and so we sell the regular solid colors. And then we also sell the sparkly colors. So there's a lot of different colors. And then in ponytails, we have the solids, and then we also have the sparkly ones too. Here, yeah, we have chains. They sell them at nearly a dozen Seattle area locations <laughs> and online. So there's stripe and then the polka dotted ones. Between sales and donations, they've raised some $40,000 since starting the guild in 2012. All of the money goes to pediatric brain tumor research at Seattle Children's. What a nice cause. <laughs> Auctions, lemonade stands, an annual 24-hour scuba diving event. These are among the reasons childhood cancer survival rates have risen and treatments have become more effective with fewer side effects. Three, two, one, go! Run of Hope, a fundraiser for pediatric brain tumor research, has raised more than one and a half million dollars over the past five years with the Four Seasons Hotel Seattle as a partner. I think it's such a successful event for two reasons. One is the natural philanthropy that exists within Seattle. Uh, I know in the time that I've lived here, I'm just completely surprised to see how giving uh, people are in this wonderful city. I also think it's the fact there was a, there was a need. Uh, there's a very specific need for this uh, type of research, and there's not a lot of funding sources for it. Some more runners coming across. Love those more. Run of Hope grew out of one mom's personal experience with pediatric cancer and the difference research made. What got me involved was when, um, in 2004, when my son was eight years old, he was diagnosed with a high-risk cancerous brain tumor. And um, the odds were not good for him. And he went on an investigational study protocol, which came from the lab at Seattle Children's Hospital, had done some research and come up with this protocol. And um, my husband and I truly believe that that is what saved his life. And if that, that protocol wasn't offered just a year before he was diagnosed, and we've always just been forever grateful for the people that did raise money for that protocol to have even been developed. The National Cancer Institute gives less than 4% of its budget to pediatric cancer research. So it's not government funding, but private dollars that drive the quest for cures and better treatments for childhood cancer. Have fun, everybody. From fun runs to scuba dives to ponytail holders at a dollar a pop. Oh, you look really so pretty. Good. It all adds up and just might be the key to conquering childhood cancer. It's a good thing. That it's like service. So I like the feeling when you help somebody, you feel like you've made a difference in somebody's life and you've helped somebody that's not yourself. Here's your change. Have a good day. Have a good Thank, day. You. Thank you. Coming up, meet some survivors, young adults who have conquered childhood cancer. Finally tonight, we'd like you to meet some graduates, those who came in as teens and young adults and conquered childhood cancer here at Seattle Children's. We check in to see how they're doing now. <laughs> nice change. Oh, big rock. For Heather, life after cancer is filled with laughter. <laughs> She's a mom and wife. Good throw. Seven years in remission from a pediatric form of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. She was diagnosed at 18. It was really difficult to um, face the reality that, you know, I'm 18, I just graduated high school, life is supposed to be just starting, and now I'm faced with the reality that life could be ending. And so that's a kind of a tough pill to swallow at an age where you're not emotionally really capable. <laughs> the same sense of humor she relies on as a young mom got her through her toughest time while at Seattle Children's. You can either get bitter or you can get better. And I just chose to get better and laugh about it. 
Thank you all so much for being here. Um, Heather and other young adult survivors share their experiences with others. You can start feeling really lonely as a patient, a young adult patient at a children's hospital. And so I used that social media. They tell how they coped well at Seattle Children's and how they cope as survivors today. Each makes a point to help others on their cancer journey. AYA survivorship. Uh, Since program. surviving a brain tumor, Nina has gone white water rafting, raised money for cancer research, even jumped out of a perfectly good airplane. She embraces life and loves to work with other cancer survivors who are transitioning back to normal life. As I was going through treatment, I was like, I, I can't go through this treatment and not not give back, not use my the rest of my life to like try to make things better and help other people. Kathy has combined her cancer experience with her budding design career to create graphic t-shirts that help other young cancer survivors express themselves. I've always been into fashion and so for me to express the way I feel and um, who I am and my cancer through that uh, is feels great it's for me to be able to combine the two things together, my passion and how I want to help everyone. You're pretty good at walking in the sand. Conquering childhood cancer just as they were making the transition into early adulthood has definitely shaped who these young women have become. As tough as it was, Heather wouldn't trade it. Things that would have totally ruined my day before my cancer diagnosis, now when something like that happens, I think if this is the worst thing that happens to me today, it's been a good day. And to have that outlook on life at such an early age, I just think is so invaluable. Oh, you really love the water, huh? Yeah. You want me to get a kiss? Life is gorgeous and beautiful and amazing, and being a survivor is wonderful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Blow kisses. <laughs> The majority of children, teens, and young adults do conquer childhood cancer, and the people here at Seattle Children's work hard to make that so. We would like to thank all of the patients, families, doctors, nurses, and staff who helped us take an inside look at the cancer care unit. Thank you for sharing this journey with us, and thank you for watching. To learn more about cancer care and research, or to donate, go to seattlechildrens.org. Good night. Good job, bud. How's it going?